So this is my first slide, as you see. I've got shed loads of letters after my name. I've got really big job titles. So that must make me a leader. You know, that must make me really cool. And the pre presence I try and command is, you know, this steely granite look. And even at the, some of my presentations I give, you know, I can give that steely, steely granite look uh, on my first slide. The reality is, this is what people probably think when they see that, to be frank. You know, you look a bit of an arse. I think there's a time and a place for using qualifications or their need for qualifications. I also think it's really important that we don't confuse qualifications necessarily with competence, because I think that's down to education and experience, um, or indeed leadership, which I think is something very different. One of the key things, I didn't find this all out on my own, uh, so I'd just like to thank a few people. I've been lucky enough to do some of the great programs. Uh, I'm a Generation Q Fellow from the Health Foundation, and a Scottish Patient Safety Fellow. I've been involved with the College of Paramedics for a number of years, and in the Edinburgh Resuscitation Group. As Andrew said, I'm a consultant paramedic at the Scottish Ambulance Service, although I've been on to comment recently to Scottish Government, uh, and I've recently been asked to do a bit of lecturing at Robert Gordon Institute. So, you can imagine, the consultant paramedic you're just getting some papers published, and this is what you come up against when you come into work the next day. This is National Press in Scotland, basically criticising the work you've done and you've been leading on. Your clinical knowledge, your expertise at dealing with cardiac arrest will not get you through this. The two things you'll need is your own personal resilience and a good leader, a mentor, a coach, somebody you can turn to to help you with this. It will feel as if there's a tsunami coming over you. The work we did in Edinburgh around cardiac arrest was award winning and with one newspaper article the criticism came from all sides. It's really important the staff work around you, the stakeholders you work with, your program and your credibility that you can carry on even in that face of adversity. But how do you do that? Very often you'll find yourself in this chaos and anarchy in your top right quadrant. Certainty will be low, agreement will be low, and your anxiety will be high. What I will do after this evening is I'll, I'll let Andrew have uh, some of the references that, for some of the models I'll share with you. Uh, and you can go and look them yourself. As paramedics, clinically, we're used to working in that top right quadrant. Two o'clock in the morning, rain, you haven't got image in the way our colleagues do in hospital, you have to make some decisions to get you through things. Being on a leadership journey and leading programs is no different. You'll be in the dark, you'll feel cold and wet, and what you need to do is have that resilience to get you through. Anybody who's seen me present before will, will have uh, heard me very often talk about Yoda and Yoda being a, a great master. So I take some of my essence of leadership from him. So what you're going to have to do is know who you are. Stick to your values, play to your strengths and your own motivation. If we talk about leadership in the late 80s, early 90s, what you were asked to do was carry out your own gap analysis on yourself. Find out what you're not good at and then go and be better at it. True leaders will know what their strengths are and surround themselves with other people who are strong in other areas. You need to know how you learn. 
how you grow and how you regenerate after a, a, a knock or an impact. You need to understand where you'll make the most impact. And don't forget, the most important thing a leader can do is not create followers, it's to create other leaders. I've been very passionate about my profession and being pro-paramedic. What we need, I don't need to be, to be making other mini-me's. What I need is for, for me to develop the leadership cohort that's coming behind me to lead the next generation. So, I've been asked to share with you my journey and what that means to Paul Gerrans. So my values are, I put the patient at the heart of what I do. When dealing with patients, it's very easy to become task or injury focused. I always put my patient first. I'm aware of national policy and strategy. In control, might have three outstanding treble nine calls. And it might be 10 minutes after my finishing time when I get to the job. Know what your values are. Set a line in the sand. Don't compromise them. Andrew and I were talking um, just before the webinar about the changing face of the ambulance service. I've been in the ambulance service 27 years. When I trained, it was vocational training. And we very much focused on immediately life-threatening patients, major trauma and cardiac arrest. That's where my strength lies. I've got a great group of guys and girls who work for me, who deal with high-end critical care and in a specialist paramedic role in primary care. I'm not a primary care paramedic. I couldn't work to the level they work to. I don't understand the drugs they use or the way they enter the patient pathways. So I've got my strengths, but I build a team around me with their strengths. And motivation. Patients what motivates me and promoting the profession. And it's really important for the people I'm expected to lead that I maintain my credibility. So I still do my clinical shifts on the helicopter, Helimed 7-6. And I still work on the cardiac arrest core in Edinburgh. That's my core value. Immediately I threaten and work, and I maintain my credibility doing that. I think there are quite a lot of people in senior leadership roles who do lose touch with the front line. So don't forget where you've came from. Stick to what you know well. You need to know how you learn. So for me, it's experiential learning. I have done my masters, and I do hope to go on and do a doctorate, but I really struggle with studious learning. When I signed up to do my masters in leadership, within about two weeks, I suffered a really bad shoulder injury. So what I decided to do Rather than go through the program module by module and get the books, knowing I was going to be off at home for months on end, I uh, ordered them all. And this is what arrived. It's not the way I learn. I've got dyslexia. This really, really threw me. The idea of things like this, webinars and different ways of learning, Keep you motivated, make it exciting, and make it enjoyable. So find out how you learn. You also need to grow and regenerate. Keep reinventing yourself. When I was a paramedic, as in in the back of an ambulance, I always I had the same values. I thought what I was doing was the best for the patient. I was giving them two litres of salty water that was cold and I thought it was a hero. Big Venflon, two lines and loads of salty water. To grow and regenerate you have to realise that was then and practice will have changed. You need to be open to that change, you need to be receptive. Back in 2000, 
The Scottish Ambulance Service had a mantra that we were the best ambulance service in the world. And that's very, very naive. You need to travel, you need to learn from other people. I've been lucky enough, uh, as part of my fellowship, I was able to travel to Seattle Medic 1, I was able to work with the MICA paramedics in Melbourne, and I was able to travel to Denmark to look at what they do without hospital with cardiac arrest. That was fantastic. That helped me grow as a clinician, remotivate and regenerate myself. But how else do you learn? My role now, although I'm a paramedic, is around policy and strategy and leadership. So I have attended a, a business school to do my masters and I now do work down at the Scottish Government. And I'll talk a little bit later about how you influence. You need to understand how you can make an impact. The reality is, looking back, I was really an angry man. I probably came across, in fact I did come across because I've had this feedback, I've almost been anti-physician. When doctors started working in pre-hospital care initially, I was very much, that's my job, nobody's listening to me, and I would be standing up in my soapbox, shouting, bawling, banging the table, I'm a paramedic, that's not the way to lead the profession, you need to understand how and when you can make an impact, and being an angry man's maybe not the way to do it. So when the opportunity arises to work here at the Scottish Government, fitted in very much what I've talked about. I was able to learn, learn from others, not clinicians, but people who have had big roles and big jobs on a national scale and were able to influence and take forward scale, uh, change at both scale and pace. And the funny thing was when I was in that environment, people recognised that I was there as the pre-hospital care expert. I didn't have to make that noise, I didn't have to prove myself, I didn't have to bang away. It gave me the space to learn, grow, regenerate, motivate myself and absolutely be able to influence policy and strategy. Next thing is about realising your role in growing the next generation. So you can't do it on your own, you need a council, you need a Jedi council to help you. These are the guys who helped me grow as a leader. It's Dr Colin Robertson, Dr Gareth Clegg, Dr Alastair Gray, Dr Richard Lyons and Dr Robin Mitchell. The key thing is all these guys that I had to look up to in the early part of my career were medics. There were no real role models or leaders in positions that were, had influence that I could look up to from the paramedic profession. This is the College of Paramedic Council meeting recently. This is a group of paramedics who have been voted into roles by their peers and have taken forward the profession. I know quite a few people around this table and I've known them for a long time. The guy sitting uh, on the left hand side of the screen halfway down, a guy called Jerry Egan. Jerry won't mind me saying he's been a paramedic a long time. He's now chair of the uh, chief exec of the council of paramedics. But who's going to be the next chief exec? I'm sure a lot of you know Andy Newton. Andy Newton is the chair, but who's going to be the next Andy Newton? If you're in a leadership role or aspire to be in a leadership role, what you have to think is in the years to come. 
The College of Paramedics will be a royal college and will be responsible for taking forward the profession. If that's the case, my challenge to you is what can you do or what, you, what are you going to do to try and ensure you have a seat at this table in the future? Or if you're in a leadership role now, what are you going to do to grow the generation who can sit around this table in the future? One of the key things for me around leadership, something you'll need to realize, it's not about what you say, it's not about what you do. People talk about walking the walk. Walking the walk is not enough. It's better than just talking the talk, but it's not enough. You need to think how you're going to make people feel. How do you feel right now? Do you feel like you're being led well within your trust? Do you feel you have a mentoring and coaching relationship? Can I ask a question to the group that's dialed in? And if we get an answer to the question, then Andrew will bring people in. How many people would like to do a travel scholarship and go to Seattle and go to Melbourne or be seconded to DH into these leadership roles? Can we ask that, Andy? Yes, yes, they can, Paul. Um, you can either bob in um, the question below or if you pop your hand up, um, I'll be more than happy to open your microphone up. Uh, we have got one guy who's popped his hand up. Uh, Sean, are you um, happy for me to undo your microphone? Can you hear us, Sean? No, I don't think he's got a microphone plugged in. Not yeah. to worry. <laughs> okay. So my question was going to be, so why haven't you? I know when I speak to some paramedics in Scotland, I say, well, oh, that's all right for you to talk about your leadership journey. You've got to go to Seattle. You've got to go to Melbourne. I applied for the Generation Q Leadership Programme against about 350 uh, other applicants. There'd only ever been one other paramedic ever in the UK who'd been on that programme. So you have to put your head above the parapet. You have to stand there and realise you'll get some knockbacks. Has anybody else got any questions at the moment? No, there's just none, in, uh, none at the moment. Sorry, Andrew? Sorry, yes, there, is a, there isn't any questions coming at the moment for you, uh, Paul. You can type your questions into the question box, which should be on your right-hand side or just above the screen if you're using a, an iPad or an Android device. So, I want to talk about the College of Paramedics, leading the development of the paramedic profession. There's a big difference between leadership and rank. Many, many people will associate leadership roles with your Agenda for Change band or the amount of pips and crowns you wear on your uniform. I want to share a story with you. At the moment, I am the National Lead Fire Hospital Cardiac Arrest for Scotland. And we're driving forward a number of programmes. Anybody who's been following there in this space around out of hospital cardiac arrest will know that one of the key things that we can learn from our, our colleagues in Scandinavia is the need for schools and school children to learn how to do CPR. Ideally three times during their education journey. If they do that, they will have skills for life. Teaching kids to do CPR, it's not expensive. 
And the benefits, if anybody wants to look at Fred Lippert's work out of Denmark, is massive. We very recently in the UK had a bill go to Parliament uh, to make it mandatory in schools for CPR training. And it got thrown out. So when that gets thrown out, you can whinge about it, or people can stand up and do something. And the thing I want to share with you is, there was a janitor in a school in Scotland who's now le leading a movement for CPR to be carried out in schools in Scotland. He's a janitor. He heard about it and didn't think that was right and was trying to do something about it. He's not in the ambulance service. He's not a paramedic. He's not in an education role. But he's seen the need for something to be done. The standard you walk past, and if you let things happen, then you can't complain about it. That's what leadership's about. It's about getting involved and standing up and it not being about your rank. I'm probably coming to this from a through one lens when I talk about the College of Paramedics. You know, the folk who've dialed in to this uh, leadership webinar already have that presence of mind to take forward their own education and training. They realize the importance of being professional. The key thing is about taking on those leadership roles. I've got no doubt that people who are dialed in here are really good clinicians. So my next question is to the group, what are you doing to give yourself those leadership competencies and experience? Because just reading a book on leadership is not going to do it. Again, Andrew, can we give it a second and see if anybody comes back with anything? Yeah, of course we can. Yeah, just pop your hands up um, if you would like me to open up your microphone. Uh, Fleming, uh, you've got your hand up there, so I'm going to unlock your microphone. Is it open? Fleming, can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear fine. Can you? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you nice and clear. Okay. Okay, so um, I uh, recently had a stint in the independent sector, went from a trust to an independent uh, ambulance provider to see what sort of the professional standard was on that side. And um, although I did find the standard was, was relatively good, I did find though the professional was quite disjoint in, in sort of in, in, in direction, if you want. There wasn't much um, leadership, if you want. It was people were in it for their own benefit. And how, how can we sort of um, try and, and tie all that together? Specifically around the private sector? I, I mean, specifically, I mean, because now so many opportunities arise for paramedics. They're spreading all over the place. So, so we have, um, you know, go to independent sector, GP surgeries, a minor injuries unit, now going to the police, uh, custody suites and all that. We, we're spreading over a, a very broad spectrum, and, and I find it tricky to, to sort of um, to maintain the standards, if you want. Yeah. So, so again, I, th I think so that if, from a clinical point of view, you're talking about the standards being set for, for professional practice, and that's what you really call it paramedics. But I think what I'm trying to allude to is around those, those leadership roles, and Again, if somebody, if you go into a GP surgery to carry out a role and you're not professional around what you do, you won't be asked to lead a project. So it's about those key values and keeping those and display those values all the time. So put the patient at the heart of what you do. Make sure you grow and learn. Don't be uh, frightened to say that's not your bailiwick. You know that's not what you do. And put that across in a professional manner. You know, it's not about being negative. It's about saying that's not my skill set, and being open and honest. I think it's and really important that you get that you offer yourself up to try and lead in these different roles, and take up leadership positions rather than just purely clinical positions. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, and that, that is also what, what you know I did, and um, and you know that. Um, 
but I just find that um, well, I don't know. I mean, but but most most literature you read about it, it's all about you know paramedics and trusts and that. And now we're spreading so much. How can the college can they help sort of trying to tie that all together so we include more sort of uh, the broader spectrum and that's from a leadership perspective more than anything. So, so, so I'm biased. So I think that's through the College of Paramedics. You know, the, the College of Paramedics are represented from the private sector there. Critical care paramedics are represented. Primary care paramedics are represented. Uh, remote and rural paramedics, military paramedics are all represented um, through the college. And I think that, uh, having a professional college and people realising that it's not the union, it's the lead for the professional body, and then using the key statements from the college so it almost becomes a second language when you're interacting with other professions in another environment is really important. Yeah, I agree, and I think it's great, and I, I you know, I, I applaud sort of people going into other, other areas. I just don't. Um, just sometimes feel that that we lose the losing sight slightly. That's all. So thank you very much. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for that, uh, Fleming. Okay. Um, back to you, Paul. Yeah. So um, some of the key things are, and, and Fleming touched on it there, is about reading the literature. I'm pretty passionate about this. Um, if you read some really good books on boxing, that won't make you a better fighter. If you read books on how to run a marathon, it won't improve your times. If you read books on how to talk like Ted, it won't get you a TED talk. So the next thing I'm saying is you, the, the literature, and, and very often when I've, when I've done different presentations, people will say, you know, what, what's the literature? What's the evidence? And there's a, you know, a huge amount of literature out there in leadership. I think it's how you formulate your leadership role is based on three things. It's based on improving quality. So what you're going to have to do is know a little bit around quality improvement. I'm not on about key values and being able to crunch data. I'm on about how will you know what you're doing as a leader is bringing improvement. So if you're going to look at any literature, look at literature around quality improvement. The second thing is around change. Again, lots of evidence out there around change. The model I go to time and time again is the Cotter model for accelerated change. Eight steps. Quality improvement, change. The third thing is the leadership literature. And the one thing I'll point you guys to from a leadership point of view there's a book called Living Leadership by George Binney. It's one of the easier reads, I think, around leadership. And it talks about being you being you, how you interact. It doesn't matter what you're leading, whether it's the profession and a role through something like the college, or you're leading a project at GP surgery, or something on your station, or just wanting to do your own piece of work. If you use a little bit of leadership knowledge and, and go back to what I've said about its interaction with people and how you make people feel around you, it's not about your band, it's not about how many pips you've got on your shoulder. So think about people's feeling, how you interact with people, that's leadership. The quality improvement, what data you're measuring over time to make things better and use a change model, then you'll be able to look at your impact. Because what you're actually on about doing as a leader is influencing the culture around you. So has anybody got any questions around those three pillars I would put to you for changing culture? Because changing culture is what you need to do as a leader. 
Because if it's working, then you could debate people don't need lead. Okay, as again, you can type your question in or you can pop your hand up and I will unlock your microphone. They normally all wait until the end, Paul, and then, and then get you. <laughs> all right, okay. So the other thing is about um, the final thing I want to touch on is professionalism. And how we conduct ourselves as paramedics. And very often, so my, my wife's a nurse in the ED, and she will tell you know lots of tales around paramedics when they come in and they are very focused on the condition of the patient. How they've got things they like to do, and how they've got things they don't like to do. And we're all like that. Nurses are like that. Doctors are like that. We all, we're all like that. But professionalism is doing the right thing, A, when it's not what you want to do, and B, when nobody's looking. Again, talking to Andrew, we run about, you know, when people are out on assessment, the reality is they normally raise their game. Very often you don't get the jobs you need uh, when you're getting assessed. But if you truly want to lead the profession and be a professional, then what you need to do is you need to do the right thing by your patient, decide what your line and your values are, and do that all the time, even when nobody's looking. So Andrew, that's me getting towards the 40 minutes and then we'll go and open for questions. Yeah, um, if you have any questions for Paul now, you can either pop them in the question box below or again, you can pop your hand up and we will be more than happy to um, open up your microphone and you can have a chat uh, and uh, ask any questions to Paul. Um, we have got a question from um, Sean. Sean, would you like me to um, just pop your hand up and I'll be more than happy to uh, to open your mic up now you've you've managed to activate it on your uh, your iPad. Okay, I'm just going to unmute Sean for you now, Paul. Yeah. Hi, Sean. I'm not too sure whether he's got his microphone turned on yet. <laughs> he was on a, a, a mobile device, I think. Oh, Sean, I don't, th I don't think we can hear you. Oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. We've got some questions that I can read out to you instead. Yeah. Um, what Sean has asked is, uh, how do we access these opportunities? Um, his tablet was muted at the time. I think he was relating to yeah. the opportunities uh, around um, working in other places in the world. So um, there are a number of fellowships. The, the fellowship I've been involved in is the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. And again, if you do a search, on um, Google, I'll, I'll take you there to the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. The Health Foundation num run a number of fellowships. The Churchill Fellowship is another uh, great opportunity to travel and learn. And I'll be really honest, um, the, the reason I've been so lucky to do the three fellowships I've done I don't think it's because I'm anything special. I think I had a unique selling point, and that was I was a paramedic because they haven't, they do not get paramedics applying for these opportunities. Um, there's an opportunity at, later on, um, Andrew. I can share some links with you. Yeah, if you send them over, I'll, uh, I'll email them to the team. That'd be great. Well, you have to apply. You know, you have to. Put yourself out there, apply, and, and realise you know, you'll get competition is really difficult for this stuff. But there's lots of doctors and nurses already do it. A smaller number of AHPs and a very small number of paramedics. I'm aware, I can count on one hand the amount of paramedics in the UK I'm aware had any of these fellowships. So the opportunity is there. Okay, we have got another question for you. Um, 
sorry, it's not a question, but a reply to the earlier question and a comment. Uh, leadership in the pre-hospital emergency care area should not be limited to paramedics and doctors. There are techs, ECAs and ACAs with considerable experience and competence, but have limited access to leadership roles because of structures of the organisations. So again, uh, I think that was the point I was maybe trying to make and didn't come across very well about it's not about your band or your, your rank or indeed your designation. So the, the story I shared around you know leading the CPR program for schools in Scotland has been driven very much by a janitor from a school. So there will be areas of, of there will be clinical areas where it'd be more appropriate for a technician to operate in than maybe an ACA or a paramedic than a technician. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about clinical competence. We're about leading stuff on your station or in your trust. Uh, very recently, I'm aware in Scotland, there's a, a, a member of staff has, has done a huge piece of work on, on leading how we procure consumables. Massive saving um, financially to the organisation and the, reduce, the reduction of a massive headache on station for people getting frustrated when stuff didn't arrive. So that was an ACA. So, so the reality is, um, you know, we need to think about the two things separately about clinical leadership when dealing with a patient and leadership in the round about um, contributing to the system, if that makes any sense. Yes. Yep, it makes good sense. It makes good sense. We have got another question, Paul, from uh, Mike. Do you think our culture is just a culture? If so, do you think it is perceived that way? Do you think any meaningful improvement can occur until we have embedded um, just culture? So, really good question. Um, do I think we're there yet? So, I can only talk about my experience in Scotland. Uh, I think we're on a journey, I think we're closer to being there. I think we're far closer to having a just culture than we had previously. I think there's a perception that we still have a blame culture. So I do a little bit of work around sort of ex expert witness, and when you speak to to guys, they'll they'll tell you that you know John Smith got sacked in 1978 for not signing his log sheet in black pen, and um, which may well be true, but things have moved on. I'll also hear horrendous stories about where people have been treated badly, and I think the reality is, is uh, the ramifications of that spread quickly and stay with people for a long time. So, in answer to the question, I think we, I think we're moving towards a justice culture. I think things are a lot better than they were. I think people can always remember when things have gone badly. The other thing, I, th I, th I think it's one of the key things for improvement. One of the key things around improvement is being able to take risks and be able to make mistakes from a project management point of view. And if you think you're going to get clattered for performance every time, then you're not going to do that. So I like the, the question about it being around just culture as well. So, you know, if people do something that you know, they're negligent, they break the law, and they make a conscious decision, then there has to be some comeback for that. And that, that's what just's about. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, there'll never be um, a discipline system. It just means that, you know, we have to take ignites of, of things as they happen, and it shouldn't be the first point of call. So I think we're getting better. I think there's there's a lot of um, a lot of history around the culture of the ambulance service that that will be overcome, and that's why we need leadership, and that's why we need to grow new leaders going forward. Yeah, I totally agree with you there, Paul. Absolutely agree. I think we've seen some some big changes in a very short space of time within the ambulance service. Certainly from from when I was born, sort of 10, 12, 13 years ago, to, to today's date, um, I've I've seen lots and lots of changes. Um, and lots of really good leaders as well who's come from just ordinary technicians and paramedics 
Um, I, I know when Sean mentioned that, that sometimes some of the gateways are closed to people who aren't registered, like nurses and paramedics. But actually, within my trust, I've, I've seen some really good technicians um, who are now three pippers uh, and sector managers, and, and, and they make great examples of, of good leaders. So, so, so I'm aware in Scotland of uh, there's a head of service grade. So our grade for that, that's a, that's a crown and a pip in Scotland. Uh, and she started as an auxiliary ACA in the station. Yeah, interesting. Okay, we're going to try and unlock Sean's microphone now, um, and hopefully he should be able to hear us. Can you hear us, Sean? Yeah, I can hear you. Andy. Can you okay, hear me? we can hear you nice and clear. Now you can fire away your question. Uh, it's, it's a little bit twofold, really. One is obviously thank you for asking the question about the opportunities. The other one is um, in relation to sort of like broader spectrum of um, leadership. Um, I'm at the process of going for my master's this year with a bit of luck. Um, and something that's come upon to me is the four pillars. Um, however, when it's pushed, it's really common sense. It's education, which is the only way we can progress. Uh, but it's also uh, the community communication really been very dynamic and I think it's been picked up on a couple of times uh, it's it's a, a multi-directional it comes from below upwards and upwards downwards the problem I'm, I seem to feel is that we are quite new people aren't really taking us seriously uh, and we're struggling against that uh, maybe we're a few years away um, other than the College of Paramedics uh, how do we feel we can strengthen the word out there um, I, I work within WAST um, and a little bit different to uh, another trust I've worked with. Um, any ideas on this? Uh, so I think, again, well, so <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there is, I think there's a few things. So I think um, it's really good you're doing your master. So I think as we, it's not all about education, but I think as we get more people who no. are sitting on, on these programs, I think it gets the word out there around paramedics and, and pre hospital care sitting in these programs. Get your stuff published. You know, um, you can see a number of publications, not not just paramedic publications, but wider publications around quality and about leadership, where there's some paramedics getting some stuff published. Uh, I think uh, presenting at conferences. How many times do you go to conference? And um, you can count on one hand the amount of people from an ambulance service background who'll be presenting. There's a bit about, I think we're at the point now where we need to stick our head above the parapet. I agree, we're a very new profession. But we were doing it before, you know, it's been around a while now, you know, but even before the HCPC and the College of Paramedics. And I think at some time we have to be brave enough to take the leap. So I think it's about, and, and that personal resilience is important. So when we get knocked back, don't become the Paul Gowans of the 1990s. And standing on your soapbox and banging the table and spitting your dummy out the pram. Just realise, you know, that we're on a journey, but, but put yourself out there. Try and get stuff, you know, put, and I'm not about New England Medical Journal randomised controlled trials. What about, you know, letter to the editor, poster in your local uh, seminar, and just, you know, be prepared to get a few knockbacks and stand up. The other thing I think is really important is about being comfortable about challenge and that being a two-way thing. So challenge in a professional manner, others and those around you, if you don't quite get where they're coming from. But it's a two-way street, so when you get challenged, realise people are not having a go at you, the individual, the person, Paul Gowans. They just maybe don't understand what you're doing or why you've done it, so that's really important. Does that help? Yeah, to be honest, I think we're, we're singing off the same song sheet, to be honest. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm only, I'm only new into the profession, but uh, I think I've got about four or five years all up now. But it's just trying to spread the word and, and get that professional recognition out there. Um, I agree, it's not education, it's communication. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's two-way. And, and I really wish that I was five years into my career journey now and not and, and not coming, you know, not towards the end imminently, but I'm, I'm heading towards that way because I think it's really exciting. 
I think some of the answers around some of the challenges in health and social care, the profession uh, and the ambulance service holds the answers to. And I don't just mean the paramedics in that. You know, so we talk about doing work with people around frailty and falls, and, and can we involve other organisations? But we do have a, you know, we do have staff within our own organisation who could maybe pick some of that stuff up. I think. Yeah, I, I agree. There's there's a lot of challenges we're facing at the moment. I mean, it's in the uh, the paper at present, uh, certainly in my locality. Uh, with the increased stresses and pressures that the ambulance service is suffering and I think it's a lack of understanding of how diverse we've become and yeah. just how utilised we are and what we have to face out there. Um, I don't know, maybe there's a lot of barriers. I'm... Yeah, so I think one of the key things is, and we was talking to Andrew before we started, was it became a default position rather than designed into the system and it'll take a while to recover that, especially around the urgent care and the primary care. Uh, but I think I think the next five years is going to be really uh, pivotal in what we do, because I think we've been parachuted into this role around urgent care. And I think as education programs progress, and you know, people now, you know, I can remember having to plea with the doctor at scene or to open the doctor's letter or, you know, to be on a level. And now, you know, we've got rules where paramedics are being poached away from ambulance service to work in GP surgeries, etc. So I think we're getting there. I think it's interesting you use the word communication because it doesn't matter. I could be having this conversation doing a webinar to firemen. I could be doing a feedback to the guys at Monash in Melbourne or Seattle Medic One or at the government. It's not unique to paramedics, pre-hospital care or ambulance services. About it's the one thing all the time that is the it's the glue that holds everything else together, and it's something we're getting better at at communicating out with our own sphere of influence. But we need to get we need to improve upon it. Uh, thanks, I appreciate that, Paul. I enjoyed the conversation, mate, and uh, thank you for the presentation tonight. Good. Wonderful. Thanks very much indeed, Sean. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that is um, all the questions, Paul. I think we've got to the, okay. to the very bottom. Okay, uh, so, that's, so that's me, I think. Wonderful. Guys and girls, uh, thank you very much indeed for um, joining the webinar tonight. Uh, if you do have any more questions, you can fire them over to us, and I will make sure that um, Paul gets a copy of them, and I'm sure he will answer you directly back. Uh, again, for the certificate, for those people who have asked this, a couple of people have said, what happens to my certificate? Your certificate will automatically drop. Um, once you get your email through to say, thanks for coming to the webinar tonight, um, your certificate will automatically drop directly into your CPD portfolio where you can go in and edit and reflect about what you've done tonight and what you've learned. And also the link to the video recording of tonight's webinar will appear in there. So just give us this time to get it um, all together and uh, do the edit. And then you can go into your um, CPD diary platform there and you can edit and change it uh, as you want. Uh, tomorrow night, we have got a, another webinar, which is free of charge to attend. Uh, and that's by uh, Dr. David Spiro and myself and another um, specialist paramedic. And we're going to talk about uh, clinical case studies. So real life video cases being videoed as they happen and how we can use these to uh, both learn ourselves, but more importantly, how we can teach uh, other people within practice uh, on how to manage these different um, clinical case studies. And so there'll be one on um, paediatrics, uh, which is quite um, a very sad case because I, I think this child um, sadly dies. Um, one on a medical case and one on a trauma case. Uh, and so there will be a warning tomorrow for, for that webinar because there's some quite sensitive photos and, and, and footage to, uh, to be displayed. So that's tomorrow. If you log on to cpdme.com now, onto the webinar section, uh, you can you can register for that. I do know there's not very many places left, but uh, but it is a good webinar. And then at the end of the month, we've got Amanda Mansfield back, who's a consultant midwife for London Ambulance Service. And Amanda is going to be talking about um, pre-hospital guide and management of cord prolapse. Uh, Amanda's um, a good friend of mine, and she's recently done some webinars on breech birth, uh, which if you just search cpdme.com or cpdme breech birth, you'll be able to find the recordings now online. 
Uh, all that leads me to say, guys and girls, is t come and join us on CPDME. Have a look at some of the other webinars that are planned. We have got some fantastic speakers coming shortly. Um, we're hoping to have Paul back. Uh, in fact, one of his friends has just tweeted to say, uh, Paul is the man to talk about sepsis. And, and as you know, sepsis is quite topical today because of the, uh, the new guidelines that's been released. Uh, all that leads me to say is um, thank you very much indeed, Paul Gowans, for, for spending your time with us this evening. Yeah, that's great. Really enjoyed it. And uh, if you are going to work, stay safe out there. If you're not, sit down, relax, get yourself a cup of tea and have a good night. Thank you, people, and take it easy. Good night.